And I'm going to give, I think I can do this for both of you to make you co-hosts, um, Sarah and here you go. <laughs> okay, are we good? What is yours? All right. Well, hello, everybody. I'm going to I'm going to put a slide up while I'm doing my introduction, because this is an audience participation sort of thing. So while I'm talking, you can uh, you can work on going to that link with the QR code or with your computer, whichever makes you happiest. Uh, so I am Sarah Miller. For the purposes of today, I am your technology consultant. In real life, I'm a assistant professor of emergent, Homeland Security and Emergency Management at Pierce College, a reservist with the uh, US Department of Health and Human Services, a small business owner for emergency management consulting, and some other things. I am an emergency management practitioner turned uh, academic, and I am going to prep you for what's to come over the next 15 weeks. Uh, or so. Uh, Nick, do you want to introduce yourself now or later? Um, I'll, I, I can introduce myself later. Uh, okay. Also, are, are you, you haven't started your... Uh... No, I have not. Okay. I wanted to get everybody there first because I know that it depends on the audience. Sometimes it takes a little bit for everybody to get there. Uh, and so, um, so uh, we're going to talk about technology today and we're going to talk about how you can enhance and reshape emergency management capabilities, uh, practice, and strategies um, by learning some very basic fundamental things. By the end of this term, you're going to apply these to some sort of case study. So with that, I am going to activate this poll. So you should be able to answer the poll now. And while you're not doing that, I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I didn't share correctly. There you go, now it's active. Sorry, the Zoom button was covering it up. I thought I clicked it and I missed. And choose all of the things that you know how to do or that you have done. I'll take a minute, let people finish reading those. So it looks like everybody's mostly done clicking. I'm gonna tell you, these are fascinating results to me. I have done this exact same survey with a group of executive level emergency managers. The highest percentage I got on any one of those categories was about 4%. Um, no one knew how to do the other things. And that right there speaks to the gap that exists between your generation of emergency managers and mine or the one in front of me. There is a tremendous gap in knowledge and yet we are using technology all of the time. Um, and this points to the problem. This is why you're going to take a technology class, because not only do you have to learn these things, you have to convince other people to do stuff with them as well. So what we're going to talk about today is some of the benefits, some of the practical considerations, and some of the ethics behind using technology in emergency management. So who can benefit is really everybody. Emergency management professionals can benefit, first responders can benefit, and the public can benefit, but only if we do it well. Um, if we do it wrong, we will harm people with technology. 
So the ability, if we do it well, our, the, ben- the biggest benefit is the ability to save more lives and property. And those are always our primary focus, save lives, protect property. Uh, and we can do that better if we implement technology well. Um, it helps us with increasing our situational awareness. If you're new to this field, you will, you will quickly realize that one of the hardest things we do uh, is keep track of what's going on in our emergency. And it is the biggest challenge we face and technology can help us with that. Technology can help us with um, enhanced alert and warning. Uh, There are just this morning, I live in Washington state, just this morning, they rolled out the shake alert app for Washington state, which gives us early warning of earthquakes on my phone. Uh, And those early warnings can be enough seconds to save lives. Um, Technology can help us better understand the risk around us. And by us, I mean all people. Technology can help us perceive the risk that we face and thus help us to take better action on it. And technology can prevent, uh, give greater transparency to what we're doing. Um, if you look at the last two years, the number of city council meetings that happened via Zoom, it was unprecedented. And state laws didn't even allow it. And, uh, and now city council meetings are much more accessible. Anybody can click on the Zoom and go to city council meeting, which helps with transparency in government. The challenge, though, in technology, there are many, but this is, this is the challenge you are going to face in this class. Understanding the actual needs of your organization or the organization you represent, understanding what's actually available to meet those needs, doing a gap analysis between what's available and what you want, um, creating accurate specifications. Uh, So it's great to say, oh, we want to do X, but do you know what that actually means? Um, Finding the right vendors for these things and then spending responsibly. One of the challenges you have is every vendor is going to tell you that their product is the very best for whatever problem you have. And if you haven't clearly defined your problem and you haven't clearly specified how you want to solve the problem, that means they're all right and they're all very wrong. And you are blindly spending money when you don't necessarily understand what it is you're trying to fix or what you're trying to do with it. And so in this class, you're going to learn basics of technology. And I'm going to touch on these and tell you why they are important. You are gonna learn the basics of network technology and how it works. And that is important because everything we do anymore, technology-wise, is networked. It's networked via cables, it's networked via Wi-Fi, it's networked via data streams, it's networked and it talks to each other. And when devices talk to each other, it's great, but it also presents new challenges. It presents the challenge of, of cybersecurity incidents either uh, intentional or accidental. Uh, for for uh, In a lot of cases, you don't know if a cybersecurity incident is intentional or accidental until you've figured out what the problem actually is. You just know nothing works. And so networks and Wi-Fi are an important piece of what we do. We use so many technologies that depend on them. Um, and, and most of you, a, a chunk of, not most of you, about a fifth of you knew how to connect a device to Wi-Fi. Um, which is interesting because probably your laptops are com- connected to the Wi-Fi in the classroom. Uh, and I can see that people have laptops and tablets and devices uh, and you connected them to the Wi-Fi. That's how you're on the internet and engaging in this. So security is a huge piece of what happens in technology or should. And it is often overlooked because the people uh, who are buying products don't understand security. Sometimes the people selling the products don't necessarily understand security. And then you end up with holes and those holes cause damage. They cause harm to other people. Uh, All you have to do is a quick Google search and you will find numerous instances of of government entities um, going offline because they had a cybersecurity incident. Um, I actually terminated a relationship with a bank uh, first thing Monday morning because over the weekend when I tried to log in, uh, their system Uh, wouldn't let me log in and was producing an error that contained everything necessary to log into their systems except their password. And that it was such an egregious security violation that I took all my money out and put it somewhere else. Um, uh, I'm getting less interest on it now, but at least I know it will still be there when I go to look for it. And um, it screamed of incompetence for that have remained in that state for more than 24 hours because someone didn't take security seriously at a bank, a big bank. 
Um, and so security, you need to understand the implications of security. You don't have to be security specialists, but you need to understand how, how these systems affect you. If you have a security incident, what does that mean in your organization? Um, a, a security incident I worked um, early in the pandemic, a city was attacked with ransomware and it took down all their systems. They had some, they had experts deal with the, the computer side of things, but they had to do things like uh, send people out in a truck to look in the water reservoir and see how much water they had because they had no way to monitor it. They had good insurance. They had cybersecurity insurance. They were recovered in a week. Another jurisdiction that I worked with a little bit, kind of, but they didn't really want help. They were down for three months. So that was three months of time where people couldn't get their utility bills or pay their utility bills um, among many other city services because those people did not understand the basics of security or of planning or of response to a cyber incident. And so it's important that you understand the basics of that so that when you're looking to implement technology, you're incorporating that into your plan. Audio and visual production uh, is, is a huge component of modern society, like TikTok, YouTube, um, videos that can go anywhere. Um, but a large number of people don't know how to do that. And yet we connect with audiences and we get our message across by, by using those tools. And so when an organization doesn't know how to do that, that means they are losing the chunk of their audience that learns from watching videos or that would learn if given the opportunity. Um, open source intelligence, that's OSINT, open source intelligence gathering, which for the most part is gathering up information using social media that people have freely shared. And you can learn a lot about people. You can learn a lot about your incident. It can be a critical piece of incident response um, if we're in a large incident. Imagine a tornado or a hurricane and people are posting on social media because maybe they have Wi-Fi access, but they can't make a phone call. And so they're posting requests for help online. Uh, those can be found and you can get them help. You can also get a sense of, um, of communications failures when the, when the volcano in Tonga erupted. Very early on, there was video coming out of Tonga and then it went down as they lost communications infrastructure as the underwater cables to the island were severed by, because of the incident. Um, but you could learn from that, like the outside world could learn what was going on in Tonga based on what people were putting on social media and an international response was able to be started based on initial information. Um, GIS and mapping has become a core of what we do. You might not become GIS experts, but you certainly need to know how it works. You need to understand the basics of making a map um, and of what kind of data can be plotted on that map. Um, one of the things that you will find is you can, you can glean incredible um, information about who is going to be impacted by a disaster if you're using uh, GIS software and good data. And there's lots of data out there. You can map where your most vulnerable people are. Um, sensor data is, is something that we use a lot of. I, I noted that we have the earthquake early warning system now in the Shake app. That comes from sensor data. There's earthquake sensors all over. When they trigger above a certain point, it sends an alert, which apparently will make my phone buzz and beep and things. That's how it's supposed to work. Hasn't happened yet, uh, which is good. But sensor data is everywhere. Um, you watch uh, uh, unmanned aerial systems fly over um, uh, wildfires with infrared sensors and they can detect hot spots. Uh, they can detect people as well who might need rescue. Um, uh, there's so much you can do with sensor data. I, I mentioned the water reservoir. There's a sensor in that water reservoir that reports data out on the status of the reservoir. If you can't access it, that's why they had to send a guy in a truck out to look. And so sensor data is all around us and we can gather tremendous information from it. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of things are connected to the internet now and are all producing data, um, which means they're also producing data about you. And you need to be mindful of that. As you work in this field, you need to know what is out there about you. Um, if you're going to work in the public sector, you need to know what other people can find about you and whether you're okay with that. Um, hazard modeling has, has advanced tremendously uh, with the use of technology. We can model hazards and the impact of specific hazards in specific areas. Um, there's even some, some trial stuff going on with artificial intelligence that would tell us 
based on the data we already have about uh, people who are vulnerable and the data we have about a particular incident, say an earthquake, we know where to send resources first because we know where the biggest impacts are gonna be based on building permits and the types of buildings that are there. Um, we know where we will need to send resources without even looking. Um, obviously we will want to use our eyeballs on it eventually, but, but we know where we can do the most good initially uh, based on data and hazard modeling, um, which feed into decision support systems. So decision support systems are things that take information from a variety of sources and help you organize it and catalog it. We're starting to see artificial intelligence used in this. Uh, I'm actually working on a project that, that is using artificial intelligence uh, to um, support decision-making, but taking into special account, um, uh, uh, it's an equitable model. So it's taking into special account people of color, uh, people who are low income, people who are vulnerable in some way who historically get left out of disaster. If you read through um, the sociology literature on disaster, you will see that historically the exact same groups of people get left out every single time. Um, and it's, it's up to us to make that stop. And we have the ability to do it. We just have to figure out how to use that. One of the things you have to learn how to do is to write a business case to, to justify acquisition of technology and to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Business cases are important um, for anything, but particularly for technology, because typically with technology, you're asking somebody to fork over a lot of money for the thing that you want. And then finally, networking with other humans. Um, this is a technology class, but ultimately, um, technology is used to connect humans with each other. And so learning about technology in it requires you to interact with other humans and to learn more about it and to find specializations, to find people who know specific things. And that's, that's what you're going to see over the next five weeks or 15 weeks, roughly, is uh, your professor's network of people and the people they know coming in as subject matter experts to talk to you about all of these various topics in more detail. Um, this is what you're going to look at, and this is what you're going to learn. I'm going to touch briefly on emerging technology. Um, I love emerging technology, but this is going to be a very brief overview because you have to learn the basics as well as what's coming. So for our purposes, emerging technology is technology that's available but not widely understood or adopted by the Emergency Management Committee, or by community. By that standard, uh, YouTube might qualify as emerging technology and emergency management because almost no one in the executive leadership class that I taught uh, knew how to make a video and put it on social media. However, we're not going to consider YouTube to be emerging technology. Um, but that tells you how far behind emergency management is when it comes to technology. Uh, we're very, very far behind in some areas. So this is a laundry list of things that you might encounter in emerging technology. I talked a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence. There's more out there. Virtual reality um, has the potential, virtual and augmented reality both. Virtual reality has the ability to help people perceive risk by putting them in an environment uh, with goggles on their head and letting them experience a disaster. That can change people's minds and help them make better choices about survival. Augmented reality is something we use all of the time. People don't think about it as augmented reality, but anyone who's watched a football game in recent memory sees that the, the stripes that the, uh, the TV broadcasters put on the field, those aren't real stripes, that's augmented reality. It's showing you where the first down line is in a way that doesn't actually exist in real life, and that's augmented reality. It's the backup cameras in your cars um, that have the lines that show you before you crash into something. Um, and, uh, and Nick is tormenting me there because he's, he's making fun of what we called the glow puck in hockey games because um, he knows I'm a hockey fan. We hated the glow puck, just for the record. We hated it. My mom loved it because she could never keep track of it until it glowed and then she could keep track of it. So there's a purpose that there's a, there's a, there's a business case for every product that wants to be sold. Um, so, but augmented reality can really help us in emergencies. Um, if you've ever... Uh, at some point, you will experience a an area that has been hit by a disaster. All the street signs are gone. Uh, all of the stop signs are gone. All of the landmarks might be gone. 
And with augmented reality, you can pull up a map and see what was there. And it can help you figure out where you are among other things, um, but also help you understand what has happened in a better way. Uh, mesh networks, uh, Nick and I just had a discussion about mesh networks, but the ability of networks to talk to each other in small ways. So we might be able to get a bunch of devices together. They might network together and we could use them even if we don't have access to the internet. Um, Self-driving cars, they're everywhere now. Um, and they do dumb things sometimes, but they also have the ability in a disaster, for instance, to evacuate people who can't drive. Um, if, if you could harness people with self-driving cars and send them to the person's house who can't drive, suddenly they can evacuate uh, in a way that they couldn't previously. 3D printing is, uh, is you're, they're, they're 3D printing houses now. And um, that has the ability to really enhance recovery. If you can rapidly construct houses, um, it, it's helpful especially with some of the issues we have with being able to buy building materials even now. Uh, you've got nanotech, so uh, very microtechnology that can be used for a wide variety of applications, um, granular imagery and GIS. So it, it, some of the first things we knew about the Tonga volcano and the destruction came from satellite imagery that was so detailed, it was like you were standing there. And that can very much help us in a disaster because we don't necessarily have to be at the location to see what's wrong. Um, unmanned aerial systems, whatever you want to call them, drones, people call them drones, um, have a lot of use in technology. And, and that borders on being basic technology versus emerging technology. We're still barely touching the surface of what they can do, uh, but more and more agencies have adopted them for various things. Um, Cryptography, and we're not talking about the crypto bros and crypto currency. We're talking about actual cryptography that is used to create blockchain. And blockchain for us can be a game changer in how disaster contracts are done. We're not talking about exchanging money. We're talking about the tracking mechanism by which paperwork can be done. There's the recovery process is uh, full of paperwork. And it might be that it can be handled far more efficiently using blockchain, which guarantees um, that it's not messed with, that it follows a certain chain, it can automate approvals, but we're not, we're very much not there yet. Uh, we've got the internet of things, we're all using them, we all have stuff that's connected to the internet, but that can tell, that can be useful in gathering data that we can use. Um, if we are experiencing a disaster, if we are, um, if we think we're gonna experience a disaster, I'll tell you one of the coolest things about the Tonga volcano is there's, there's, there's people all over the world who have weather stations mounted to their garages and their roofs and out in their fields. And all of us with weather stations were able to look at our weather stations and the barometric pressure readings and see when the shock wave from that volcano passed over our own homes all around the world. The first and the second shock wave in many places. Um, and that's, the, that's part of the internet of things. That data is being reported by people who are just broadcasting their weather stations on the internet, and um, you, that can be harvested. Uh, you've got location and tracking technology. Um, some of that's not an emerging technology. Some of it can be used as emerging technology. Big data is the thing. Big data is, um, there's so much data out there that we do nothing with that we could learn a lot from if we, if we analyzed it correctly. Um, and we, we don't. We don't in emergency management typically have people who are big data experts who actually do something useful because data is just a pile of stuff. You have to analyze it and turn it into actionable. Um, well, I'll use the word actionable intelligence. So there's a process by which you, you gather data, you process it or analyze it, and you turn it into something useful that you can do something with. And, and we don't do that enough. We are. We tend to not be a data-driven uh, profession. We tend to be a, well, this feels right kind of profession. Instead of using the data that is surrounding us to make decisions, we're just not. And part of that is because the, the current generations of emergency managers don't necessarily understand what data is out there, nor do they understand what they can do with it, and how they can har harness it. And finally then, open source intelligence. Um, this has been part of the intelligence community for a long time. But when we start to incorporate it into emergency management, 
we're able to make better decisions. We're able to have better situational awareness. We're able to better track things that might cause us harm in the future or cause us harm now. We might even be able to stop things. And so that's, that's where technology is going. Some of it you can see already in place and some of it is coming slowly. I'm gonna play this video. Um, it's brief, but I think it's really good to talk about how innovation can work. Unfortunately, we are entering an era where extreme weather events will become ever more frequent in a world that is going to be affected by climate change. We need to get better at how we're responding to these disasters. The purpose of the Safe Steps DTEC Awards is to create a focus on a new technology category, disaster technology, to bring the same type of intensity and energy and enthusiasm that innovators and venture capitalists and business people, NGOs have brought to other kinds of technology, FinTech, EdTech, MedTech, etc., but to bring that to technology that will make disasters less disastrous and save lives. So some of the things that we have seen over recent years is the use of drones to assess uh, disaster damage, the ability to reach hard to access communities who otherwise cannot reach hospitals themselves through telemedicine is already saving lives. Safe Step DTEC Awards provides a great platform to budding and talented uh, for profit and not for profit organizations to showcase how technology can make a difference in mitigating disasters and natural calamities. There is no way a single agency, even one as big as the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, can meet all of those needs. It is our collective responsibility to harness technology for good. I want to see innovation to continue. I want to see this partnership to continue. And with this initiatives like this, I do strongly believe that the future is absolutely in good hands. So I want to thank the Prudence Foundation and all the other partners that have been involved in making the Safe Steps competition happen, to thank and congratulate all the participants. And we hope that together we can make Disaster Tech a category that attracts many more innovators and brings much more financial support for making the world a safer place. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to skip the exciting music. Um, I'll put that link in there because you really should go look at the awards that they've given in the last couple of years because they're pretty they're they're pretty phenomenal. Like people are doing cool stuff in this in this uh, realm. Um, so this is Everett's uh, Diffusion of Innovations, and this is just a brief um, visual of how technology gets adopted pretty universally. This was originally a communications um, theory but it really um, applies to technology. You can look at it and see it. So when a new technology comes out, there's about two and a half percent of the people are like, yes, I want every cool new thing and they get it. They've had it. And then there's the early adopters. Um, early adopters are your friends who always have the really cool stuff and know how to use it already. Um, then you've got this early majority, which is about a third of the people. So, then you've got, then after that, the late majority and then the laggards. Uh, the laggards are the people who are still using Blackberries. I always pick on the Blackberry users because um, it's really old technology at this point. Yes, there are some that are now Google um, uh, devices, but, but the reality is a very small number of people are innovators. They're the people who, who have piles of dead technology in their closet. I say this as a person who has piles of dead technology in a closet in the basement that we bought that was cool that that was never got to this early majority uh, and uh, no longer exists. People don't use it anymore. You can't buy things for it. It doesn't exist. But you see this in disaster in, in emergency management as well. Emergency management and government tend to overall be out here in the late majority and laggards by and large. There are few besides the military. Government is rarely in this front half of this curve. They're always on the back half, which means that just by default, if you're in government emergency management, you're behind. 
And that's a hard place for us to be because we could be doing better work if we access what was available to us. So some of the things you have to think about in adoption of technology is how do you decide what technology your organization is going to adopt and when are you going to do it? You can't be early adopters. Government cannot afford to waste money on stuff that is never going to come to fruition. Um, but can you always afford to be laggards? No, probably not. I look at organizations that are emergency management organizations that are not actively engaged in, in social media at this point. They are the laggards of the laggards, and they don't have effective ways to talk to their communities necessarily. And you have to think about how you access technology on the fly during an emergency. You may have an emergency and you may need to access something you've never used before, but it's suddenly you have a use case for. So there's a lot of barriers and issues around this, um, reliability, ethical issues, security we talked about, policies. You have to have policies for this. Uh, when I worked for city government, um, somebody decided to finally we needed a drone policy. You, you, uh, and then they discovered that like four different city departments had already gone out and bought themselves drones and were flying them around. They didn't have licenses for them. There was no there was no control over it. So they ground they literally grounded the city drone program, wrote a policy, got everybody their training, and then let them start and let them start flying again. But part of it was public perception because, of course, the cops bought a black drone, um, which is the it's a very it's a very threatening looking drone when you see it buzzing around the sky. A white drone is much less threatening, uh, and um, so it's the public perception of technology as well. A lot of times we reinvent the wheel. I can't tell you how many times somebody tells me their good idea about technology and it's literally something that already exists. They just didn't look, they didn't use their networks um, before they spent a lot of time developing a thing that already exists. We lack scope. We're like, yeah, I need, I need to do, uh, we need to be on social media. That's what my mayor told me. That's not a scope. That's, that's a, that's a that's something else. But everybody ran out and got on social media, and then we didn't know what we were doing. Why did we have social media? What were we doing with it? Did we have policy? No. But and so we didn't have scope for that project. Um, what's the cost? It can be very expensive, and you just might not have the funds. Um, it might not be easy to use. If you implement technology and nobody can use it, um, you're going to have issues. I, I used to work for a police department and we rolled out a new computer-aided um, dispatch system and report system it required everybody to type. Within about two months, there were a bunch of officers who were on report because the reports were so late. And when they were finally asked why their reports were so late, they didn't know how to type. They were old school. They had written their reports by hand their entire lives. They'd never learned to type. And they had to sign up a bunch of cops for typing class at the community college because they couldn't write their reports. <clears throat> so it seemed like a good idea, but they, they missed that lack of scope. They didn't do a good business case and suddenly it cost them more money and it got people in trouble who were embarrassed to say, oh yeah, I don't know how to type. Can you send me to typing school? Uh, and so they didn't. Um, and we create solutions sometimes that are unsustainable. You might buy a fancy thing, but if you don't have the money to continue making it work, um, it, it, it dies and now you, have, now you have a closet full of dead technology. I strongly encourage you if you get a chance to read uh, The Ethics of Disaster by Naomi Zak. These ethical considerations come from her book, um, and, but I've adopted them to technology. So, but solutions that are not equitable, which means you have to understand what equity is. Solutions that don't ensure safety and security. We can make all kinds of great solutions, but if they're not focused on safety and security, they probably don't belong in our, in our toolkit. Um, solutions that don't address an articulated need. So many times people are like, yeah, I created a really cool thing. Okay, so who needs that thing? Well, I don't know. I was hoping you could tell me. Well, that's not how it works. I mean, it can work that way. Um, but, but if you can't articulate that need, um, why are you buying technology to solve that need? And this last one, who is not being served by your solution? We've seen that a lot with the pandemic and people going to remote learning uh, in places that don't have broadband access. So the only way you can go to school is if you can be on the internet and they don't have broadband access. The only way you could go to the doctor was to do it by telemedicine in communities that don't have broadband access. This failure cost people, um, I, I don't know that it cost people lives, but it certainly was an inequitable solution 
um, that someone needed to have figured out a way to work around. Because you have to ask yourself, who isn't served by my solution? Any questions on that before I turn it over to Nick? All right, Nick, it's all you. Oh man, that is uh, that's scary, and I feel bad for all of you. Um, let me see here. I need to share a screen, not that one. Here we go. This one. So my name is Nick Lalone. I, I guess I should talk about myself since I said I wasn't going to introduce myself earlier. Um, there's a URL before I introduce myself at the top of all of my slides. If you have questions while I'm talking, um, just go there and type your question. Uh, I'll address it either when I get time or if it makes sense for where I'm at at the moment, um, I'll start talking about it then. Um, let me, uh, this will be fine. So where I wanted to start was where basically Sarah had ended. Um, she talked a lot about, you know, different technologies, all of these different routes and reasons that she would want to use them, what you have to think about as you're uh, considering what technologies are appropriate for the agency that you're a part of, uh, for the budget that you're a part of, for the use cases that you're a part of. Um, but there's a lot more that goes into technology use, right? The, there's a great debate. Um, I, I won't bring it up, but basically there are hundreds of thousands of pages written about computer science education. And the basic lesson that comes out of all of them is none of us can remember how we learned how to read. How are we supposed to teach people how to write programs, use technologies in this way if, if we don't remember what it was like to actually learn them in the first place? And um, so we keep, I, I guess I'm speaking from the inverse side where Sarah is talking about emergency management adopting technology. I'm going to talk a little bit about technologists constructing technology to be used for emergency management. Now, to get back to who I am, uh, my name is Nick Lalone. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, my primary, my college is the College of Information Science and Technology. Um, but my background is in sociology. Um, I'm in an iSchool, and what the iSchools are meant to do is to bring together social scientists and technologists to get together and actually find solutions to uh, either problems caused by technology or problems that can be maybe aided by technology. Um, at current, my emergency management realm is, uh, I'm working with Chet Hunter, who's the current IAEM president, um, for Region 7. I'm the sort of Nebraska representative and I'm outreach for this particular region. Um, and I'm also working with uh, the Emerging Technology Committee of the uh, of IAEM. And so uh, I guess I'm also working for the Higher Education Symposium. If, if you, uh, throughout the course of this class, want to submit something, uh, maybe a poster or a paper, to a, a higher education symposium and go to maybe Emmitsburg where FEMA is, or where FEMA's or the Emergency Management Institute is, let me know. Um, I can help with whatever it is that you might need. So moving forward, I wanna talk a little bit about maybe use cases, um, ways that uh, technology can be abused, um, sort of barriers to integration and the kind of force needed to get folks who maybe don't know what YouTube is or how to get a video up on YouTube, how can I force them to learn how to type or to learn how to record videos? So the easiest way for me to kind of talk about technology from the technologist's perspective Oh, Sarah is posting some information in that is very necessary over there. Sarah is pulling up chat. It's the term crisis informatics. Um, so technically, I am the first generation of iSchool PhD people to go out as a crisis informatics researcher. And what is crisis informatics, you might ask? Um, I still don't really know, but the easiest way to define that is that it is looking at how information communication technology, right? That sort of underlying structure that allows Internet of Things, internet communication, text messaging, cell phone use, email, social media, 
how does that actually interact with emergency management? Um, and along those lines, we look at each individual uh, disaster as a, a way for us to maybe deepen our understanding of how technology and emergency management interact with one another. Now, the sort of uh, case that interested me um, and kind of supercharged a lot of what it was that we were doing was this earthquake in 2011 in Virginia. And what this uh, little movie is showing you is that within four seconds, somebody had tweeted, oh my God, there was an earthquake. This is faster than uh, any of the tools that were in use at the time on Google. So USGS updates, where are the earthquakes? Um, they updated slower than the first person who was tweeting. Now, the issue with this is pretty straightforward, but it might not make a lot of sense at first. And that is, during a disaster, so much information is created, so much information is created that you have to sift through it with some sort of automated means. And so this was one of the most eye-opening moments for me. Uh, I basically was a new PhD student at Penn State. My advisor said, here's a computer scientist. His name is Hyun Woo Kim. I want you to sit down with Hyun Woo and I want you to go through the data that he collected from the Boston Marathon bombing. And I want you to figure out some questions you can ask of the data, verify that that information you're asking is, is, is worthwhile and move forward. And he pulled out his data set and he said, you know, I have a hundred million tweets and it's in our high performance computing cluster, which is basically a super computer. We can ask any for anything that you want of it. Uh, but for right now, it has to be a yes or a no question. Uh, I've cleaned the data down. I removed all unique. Uh, I got all of the retweets and things out. And I've cleaned that 100 million down to 20 million. So 19.6 million. And so he and I sat in that room with no windows or anything for seven straight days trying to figure out what we could actually ask of this data. And so if you're talking about you know, new technology use, even though I was pretty tech savvy, I'm suddenly in a room with somebody who has so much information that I don't know what I can ask. And every question I would say, I want to know the answer to this, he'd say, we can't ask in that way. And so seven days straight and all of our common ground, our decision processes on how to work with these data, all of this occurred on the seventh day. And we were so tired by the end of it that we didn't speak a month after this, for a month after this. And what we ended up coming up with was during the Boston Marathon bombing and the investigation that came after it, um, there were two groups that were trying to identify who the bomber was, and that was Anonymous and Reddit. Anonymous was pursuing this idea that there was a false flag operation going in there, and we'll come back to that. What Reddit was doing was trying to identify who the bomber was because the FBI did what the FBI does, and they said, can the public help us? And they opened up a tip line that allowed people to send data to it. And from, my under from what I've been able to put together, the FBI got about seven petabytes of data in the course of like three or four days. And what a petabyte is, like let's say my phone has 512 gigabytes on it. A petabyte is a thousand terabytes. Just a mat, I don't know how else I can talk about this without getting into math. It's a lot, we'll just say it's a lot. And they had no capabilities to actually go through that much data at once. However, Reddit had been, right after the Aurora shootings in Colorado, had started to shift what their platform was capable of from gathering information to gathering information in real time and analyzing it and providing actionable intelligence to anybody who was interested in it. And so throughout the Boston Marathon bombing, the media began to turn towards Reddit more than public information officers or public officers of any kind. And it was a fantastic thing to view from our data set perspective, discussion about Reddit throughout the course of these 10 days that we were gathering data 
they mentioned Reddit 39,000 times or 14,000 times. So that amount of information required us to, thank you, to um, basically take this huge amount of data that we collected and we were basically picking out like a couple of potato chips from the bag that might taste good. Now, the interesting thing that happened with Sunil Tripathi and Mike Mulagata was that Reddit's investigative capabilities had a sort of chain that they would go through where one analyst would look at it, it would get sent on and verified, it would get sent on and verified, it would get sent on and verified. Uh, and what Reddit had been trying to do with a lot of this stuff was to essentially replicate OSN, or they were replicating sort of verification from analysts. And at one point or another, from everything that we could tell, um, this organization called Poll, which factors into a whole lot of things after this event that have to do with misinformation and disinformation in the midst of disaster, uh, seems to have infiltrated what Reddit was doing, fed these two names, verified them on the behalf of Reddit, and then the media began to pick up on these. Now, if you don't know what happened with the Boston Marathon bombing, Sunil Tripathi and Mike Mulligetta, their names appeared because they were, quote unquote, mentioned on the police scanner. Um, Kate Starbird, myself, a whole bunch of us that were doing work in the Boston Marathon bombing, we've listened to this dozens, if not hundreds of times now. We've never seen these names. These names originate from one tweet and they somehow got involved with what Reddit was doing and they end up causing Reddit and the crowd and crowd-based sort of investigation to be completely destroyed. And the interesting part about this, and the reason I'm kind of talking about it for a while, is that misinformation, the study of misinformation, and all of that stuff uh, begins here, right? This is where we saw something occur into like a conversation I had with Kate Starbird at Penn State in 2014. We talked about this event, and she went at, from this and started to look at when it occurred in other places and how it's occurred since then. And so when we're talking about abuse cases of information technologies, this is a huge one. There is a group of actors out there who will do everything they can to create a new disaster on top of the one you're already responding to. And so when you're using technology and trying to figure out what technologies you want, this is a huge um, thing you need to worry about. So what it comes down to is crisis informatics and the work that we've been doing in crisis informatics and trying to create systems that emergency management can use, we're stuck with where computer science is right now. We have to analyze the data after it's created. So I was looking at Boston Marathon bombing data some six, seven months after, the, after it occurred. Um, Hyun Woo, who had created this really amazing um, Twitter scraper, he essentially replicated, and, and I should add illegally, uh, the scrape, uh, the Twitter fire hose. And so we were basically hammering Twitter system to the point where we eventually got ourselves banned. Um, but this ecosystem is fragile, and it's fragile because every single step of us pulling data from Twitter we have to clean that data in some way so that we can start to glean information from it. And when we talk about gleaning information, we're talking about transforming the data in such a way that a computer who is the most literal and like unable to improvise object ever created, it has to be told exactly what to look for. So, these complex dependencies, so for our Twitter data, we had something like 30 or 40 um, additional things that had to be brought in to examine our data. Um, so we had to be able to separate when we pulled in data usernames, we had to be able to um, examine what URLs were being used, how what hashtags were used. We had to look at how many different times certain accounts would be uh, communicating every single point along the way, something could fail. And so one of the things Sarah and I talked about when we were talking about how to, how to communicate technology things 
is that a long time ago, especially in the 90s, when you had things like Windows Vista or Windows 2000, these sort of unstable operating systems, uh, technologists went to emergency management and said, hey, check out what this can do. But at the time, you know, my phone, when it got a call, could suddenly force my keyboard to start typing for whatever reason. Or it might, I might accidentally move the mouse, which then will set off this chain reaction related to screensavers that will crash that entire system. The hardware related to technology, we are able to make sure that everything looks great. This is what UX has allowed us to do. But what UX does is hides the computer from you in an effort to make it easier to use. Um, if any portion of that stuff behind the UX crashes, that product is useless because you can't use it anymore. And so when we talk about how much of a dependency, uh, how much we have to worry about when we're working with this much data at once, 99% of your time is going to be spent on data cleansing. Once you clean your data and get it to where you're at, yeah, geobytes, uh, it requires even more stuff. And the thing with um, like machine learning or artificial intelligence or information retrieval comes all the way down here to training optimization. In order for us to create artificial intelligence or machine learning that emergency management can use, we need to have a data set that allows us to predefine all of the potential outcomes we're going to have from our data. And the thing about disaster is disasters are always extremely local, which means that if I have training data that comes from Orange, Texas, where nobody actually speaks English and pretends that they do, we're never gonna be able to understand if somebody's talking or how they're talking or what they're talking about, right? It's like talking to that guy from uh, King of the Hill. But, and so these are the things that, these are the roadblocks that have kept crisis informatics from really having something that's attractive to emergency management in any way, shape, or form. And so I am the first generation of these particular researchers, but if I look at my parents, they've been failing for over 15 years and have gotten absolutely no traction whatsoever. We know that there's capabilities and potential to it, but we don't know how. And so this is kind of a discussion of like in the weeds, why is it that computer technology is so hard to use? We often blame emergency managers. Well, they don't know how to use YouTube. They don't know how to use social media. But on the flip side of this, from my perspective and sort of where my work begins, what would it actually take to get these types of people to use these products and almost universally it is that they are so complicated to actually get going and using properly that it's just not worth the time. And so this is where um, I've sort of began the pandemic. I was like, okay, so the thing that I got hired to do has been failing for 15, 20 years now, depending on where you're at, because uh, crisis informatics sort of begins with the study of the World Trade Center disaster and BlackBerry usage, <laughs> just to bring that back up. So what would it actually take? And so I've been examining this, talking to people, getting more involved with emergency management, getting into advanced academy and doing all of these things, getting my CEM so that I can go and become a better uh, sort of creator of technologies for emergency management. And one of the things that I've sort of um, been coming down to lately, and I guess I need to wrap this up relatively quickly, so we're going to skip some stuff, is that uh, we need to write mindset. And the thing that comes out of this, um, because I teach a course on management, basic management um, of technical firms, is that um, in the United States, we have a very different mindset than other places might have. And the study of how Japan and the United States differ in their approach to technology is something that I keep coming back to with the evaluation of uh, technology for emergency management. So this is sort of the takeaway from this talk. And I'm gonna go to this too long didn't read slide. Uh, I can give you these slides, uh, a link to these slides should you want them. Um, essentially what, we'll go back to this. Um, 
it, this very bottom line, how can we design systems that improve organizational performance, right? In Japan, Japan and Japanese managers will look at what technologies will aid existing practice and make it more efficient. And so they will work with designers to make computer systems that actually begin with how practice originates. In the United States, and this is where a lot of our failure begins, and this is a lot of the sort of unspoken truth for all of the crisis informatics stuff I was just talking about, we created this amazingly, uh, this amazing technical system that could scrape Twitter in real time. And we had an ability to actually gather these data and provide intelligence from them. This is what we had been developing. And our expectation and the expectation of all the researchers that I worked with until I graduated was that since the system is great, y'all in emergency management need to adopt it and use it because we said so. And that mindset doesn't work. This is a source of constant frustration um, that I hear from emergency management. Constantly is just saying these technologists came and said, I'm going to revolutionize your life, blockchain. And you're like, but what does it do? What is it? And no one knows, but it's going to solve and fix everything. And so when we get down to it, the mindset, does it matter? Well, we've been essentially talking around this idea that there is a gap between consumer culture that is completely dependent on this and emergency management culture, which is completely dependent on this. And how do we actually get these two groups together? Because if I, as a person in a disaster, have this device, I'm going to start texting my friends before I call 911 because probably phone lines won't work, but data lines will. Um, and I might send out tweets. I'll reactivate my, all of my social media accounts and start saying I'm trapped under building seven. Please help me. I can't move my arms and I need to scratch my face. Um, something like that. And so what we're at right now is if this mindset problem is the thing that is keeping technology from entering into emergency management, then we essentially are trying to imagine a future that can't exist because of this sort of origination of thought for the creation of these technologies. And so when we're talking about what the future is, for all of you who are in this class, figuring out what technologies might actually work for what you want to do is a tremendous task. It's not simple. Um, and this sort of, um, there's this growing idea because in the technical fields, we don't know what to do anymore, right? We're in this world of social media. We're on this, we're in this like weird plateau where computers are just going to keep getting a little bit faster, but not faster than as they used to be. Uh, data lines are starting to kind of fracture a lot right now. Uh, misinformation, abuse, uh, all of these different things are starting to happen online. And we're like, how do we fix any of this stuff? How do, what do we do about any of that? Um, and so what we've been doing and how kind of the way that we're talking about this and how we're gonna get there um, are so, sort of fictional accounts. And so this is the thing that uh, me and some of my colleagues have been doing is trying to write fictional accounts of an emergency management in the future that uses technology in a way that it augments existing processes. And if we can augment all of these processes and show exactly where technology can fit, then technologists can actually begin to try to realize what those visions are. And so you as new people in this space are not confined, are not polluted by like, adherence to ICS or adherence to existing practice. As new people entering this field, you have new ideas and they'll be removed from you as you get further into the field. So for right now, as you become more acclimated to emergency management, this is an opportunity for you to think about what could be the future in this world and how could we do it? So nobody sent me any questions, but I'll stop here and ask for questions and comments.
Not even Ryan Rockabrand sent any questions. I can't believe it. Let's challenge them. Yeah, it's a lot of information and we only have a few minutes left, but uh, uh, let's give them a few seconds. And I'll say this too, if you end up with questions later, uh, yeah. feel free to email either of us. We're happy to talk about technology. Um, if you're if you're planning to make this your career field, you should be joining the International Association of Emergency Managers and their Emerging Professionals Caucus and the Emerging Technology Committee or whatever your special interests are to meet the people who want to know the things that you want to know. And I'm running a special interest group on the integration of science and technology with emergency management in uh, through FEMA's higher education program. And so we'd love to have more students to come and talk to us because um, right now it's me and like three dudes. And I mean, we can sit around and talk for forever and that's fine, but we're not actually accomplishing anything. It's been amazing uh, hearing you. Thank you. We, we do need a few minutes uh, so we can wrap up the class. So I'm going to stop the recording right now. Um, sure, we'll just stop.